Good morning. I'm Janet Russell, and I'm the pastor of Christian Formation, and it is a joy to share the Word of God with you this morning. Our passage today is Mark 8, 27 to 29, and the words will be on the screen, but you might find it helpful to grab your Bible, because later we're going to look at the larger context of the passage. Mark 8, starting at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea, Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. The word of the Lord. So on January 10th, 1981, two children who were very much in love got married. Mark and I had similar values and desires for life. We had a lot of fun together and he was a pretty handsome guy. When we said our I do's, we meant them with all of our hearts and we vowed on that winter day to stay together in sunshine and in shadow. Little did we know the depths of the shadows that we would experience in nearly 40 years of marriage, and we never could have imagined the brilliant sunshine we'd enjoy with now three married children and five precious grandchildren. But on that winter day, when we verbalized our hopes and our commitments, we were truly clueless. In our passage today, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And they give their answer with surprising pluck and enthusiasm. But Jesus quickly lets them know that they have no idea who he really is or what it will mean for their lives. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come today from a variety of places on this journey with you. But wherever we are, whoever we say you are today, may we hear your voice beckoning wooing, calling us to come further up and further in. We pray in the confidence of your grace and your love. Amen. So Jesus starts with kind of a softball question. Who do others say I am? It's easy to report what others are thinking. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. That might sound kind of weird to us. John the Baptist was a dead guy. King Herod had had him beheaded. But they thought maybe, somehow, Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Or Elijah. He was an Old Testament prophet who didn't actually die, but God swooped him up to heaven with a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. The prophet Malachi had said that God was going to send Elijah back to change hearts before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Was this who Jesus was? Or was he one of the great prophets? People, other than the ones who thought he was a bit deranged, recognized Jesus was special. He spoke with unique authority and did amazing miracles. Jesus had to be right up there with their greatest religious heroes. But they saw his role as preparatory, not fulfillment, that he was God's spokesman, not God, someone to listen to, not to worship. But then Jesus got more pointed. What about you? Who do you say I am? His disciples had been with him. They had heard his teaching, saw his healings, tasted the loaves and fish. They saw demons cast out, storms stilled, and the dead raised to life. I imagine Jesus and his disciples walking along the road, and at this point, Jesus stops and turns, watching them intently. But what about you? You who have been with me, you who know me, who do you say I am? And Peter, in his delightful audacity, proclaims, you are the Christ. The Christ, the Greek word for the Hebrew Messiah, the anointed one. The word, that word carried a lot of freight for the Jews. They had waited centuries for the promised king from the line of David, whose rule would last forever. 
this king would cleanse the temple, deliver Israel from its enemies, and rule with justice. He would be holy and mighty and wise. Psalms of Solomon, an apocryphal book, written a century or two later, to, excuse me, a century or two before Christ, gives you a flavor of what they thought. See, Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over your servant Israel. Undergird him with strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, drive out the sinners to destroy the unlawful nations. James Edwards wrote, the Messiah would be God's agent in bringing in the kingdom, in sorting out the mess and the muck that Israel was in, in putting the Gentiles in their place. The Christ held tremendous political and spiritual expectations. But Jesus doesn't even comment on Peter's great insight. He just warns them not to tell anyone. And then he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Peter told them this clearly, confidently, and dear Peter would have none of it. The Christ doesn't suffer and get killed by Jewish authorities. The Christ will raise up the Jewish people, be their mighty king, and triumph over their enemies. He is their hope their power for power and honor and glory. So Peter pulls Jesus aside to set him straight, only to be rebuked. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. That word for rebuke is usually used for rebuking demons. It is strong. If Peter keeps thinking in human terms, driven by his misplaced hopes of victory, greatness, and comfort. God's purposes will be thwarted. Peter will miss knowing who Jesus really is and what Jesus wants for him. Not only is Jesus going to suffer and be killed, but the disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. Follow him in this life of self-denial and sacrificial love. When Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am? He is calling them to move beyond being passive spectators. It's like in the marriage ceremony when we say I do. You give voice to a commitment that in front of witnesses with an expectation that you are going to live out the implications. There's accountability. When Peter proclaims you are the Christ, he has passion but a woefully incomplete understanding. Jesus is not their agent of vengeance against the heathens. He will give himself as a ransom for all people. He is not the warrior to deliver them, but a servant to heal them. He's not going to purify the temple in Jerusalem. He's creating an entirely new temple filled with his spirit, which will fill the whole earth. And this all happens in Caesarea Philippi, which if you look on the Bible map is one of the farthest places north that Jesus traveled. It was named for Herod's son, Philip, and had a great marble temple honoring the emperor, along with its multiple shrines to pagan gods. Caesarea Philippi was about as far away from Jerusalem, physically and spiritually, as you could possibly be and still be in Israel. Maybe, maybe Jesus asked this question here because it was so far from Jerusalem, which was the center of Jewish hopes and expectations. Maybe Jesus asked the question here where the disciples have the time and the space to come to a fuller understanding of who the Christ was. In Caesarea Philippi, Jesus calls them to give voice to what they know, and then he takes them deeper. Earlier in chapter 8, verse 17, Jesus asked his disciples, do you, do you still not see or understand? And then a blind man is brought by his friends to Jesus, and Jesus leads him by the hand out of the village. He spits on his eyes and lays hands on him and asks him, do you see anything? 
And the man said, the people kind of look like trees walking around. So Jesus gives it another go. And then the man can see everything clearly. Is Jesus' spit not powerful enough to do it in one shot? Then Peter declares Jesus is the Christ, and Jesus begins to deconstruct all their illusions of what that really means. They still don't fully understand. They still don't see clearly. This juxtaposition of these stories is intentional. Both the healing of the physical sight of a blind man and the spiritual sight of the disciples comes gradually. It doesn't happen all at once. In the last battle of the Narnia series, the children and the Narnian creatures go through the stable door and they are stunned by the beauty of the landscape. And as they travel on, the colors become more and more vivid and the countryside seems somehow to become even more real. And the unicorn cries out, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it until now. Come further up and further in. And as they run deeper into this marvelous land, they keep encouraging one another further up and further in. Knowing Jesus is inexhaustible. There's always more to living in him. It's living in reality, what we were designed for coming home to where we belong. And it's all grace. In the story of the blind man, it doesn't say anything about his faith. His friends bring him, he follows. Jesus leads him to healing, he follows. The disciples were not people you'd choose to be the leaders of your international religious organization. They were young and foolish and greedy and selfish and divisive. Yet Jesus calls them and they follow. And by God's grace, our being here is the fruit of their following. Jesus is here today. He is turning toward you, looking at you intently. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Are you willing to follow me? In a weird sense, through this pandemic, we find ourselves in our own Caesarea Philippi, away from the religious hubbub, away from the many of our outside demands and distractions. For many of us, life has slowed down. Our world has quieted so we can hear Jesus' voice better. Or like the blind man, we've been led to a quiet place outside the village. We've been brought to a place to be healed. Even for parents who are struggling to work and do school with their kids, you don't have all the extraneous activities that fragment your lives. This does not negate the trauma and the distress from this season, but in the midst, there is a tremendous opportunity. He has brought us to a place, if we're willing to follow, where we can listen. We can hear his questions, take time to know him better, receive his healing, and grow in our understanding of the life to which he calls us. I want to encourage you not to squander it. Don't refuse God's invitation this treasure in the midst of the chaos in our world. We hear of a longing for wanting to get things back to normal. Do we really want normal again? Or do we want better than normal? Will you let Jesus take you by the hand and lead you? Let him ask you, who do you say I am? Let him help you. Let go of your misguided hopes and expectations and show you a different way to live in a very different kingdom, the place for which you were created. When Mark and I said, I do, we had no idea what that really meant. Our understanding of ourselves, each other, of marriage would grow and change and deepen. The commitments we made to each other and the implications of our, wor our words that day, we are still trying to figure out. 
it has been a miracle filled journey and Lord willing, we still have a long ways to go. Jesus never forces us to follow, but by his love and his grace, he invites us. He woos us and longs for us to know him and to keep knowing him more and more. And he says the way to do this is to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. The irony is, by self-denial, we find our deepest fulfillment. By suffering and sacrifice, we find true joy. And by giving our lives fully to him, we gain eternal life with him. We come home to the place we truly belong. Jesus is beckoning you today. Come further up and further in. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in this strange pandemic world we find ourselves in, may we say yes to your invitation to grow in the wonder of knowing you more. And when life opens up again, may our lives be better than normal because they are centered in you. Amen.